Uh, yes, thanks very much, Sabah, and to the Iraqi Democrats Against the Occupation for the invitation to, to, to speak at the, the meeting. Uh, we have a long collaboration um, that will, of course, go on uh, over all questions to do with imperialism, but um, Sabah, I won't be employing you as a door to door salesman with the book, but uh, <laughs> apart from that, we'll continue to work together. Um, and it would be quite wrong, of course, not uh, to say with George in the room what an absolutely magnificent victory that was for everybody in the anti war. Uh, everybody in the war. Um, I want to say a little bit about the, the, the mood that that represents, but I don't want, uh, in saying that, um, at all to detract from the personal effort and from the effort that the campaign must have put in. Because it's one thing for a mood to exist, it's another thing to be able to capture it. And that requires um, guts, and it requires courage, and it requires organisation, and all that I know will have been necessary in order for George to win. So my personal congratulations to him for that. Um, but it does say something about not just the work that was put in, but the mood that it captured at the end of the day. And that mood is so often hidden and so often denied in the popular uh, press and in the mainstream media, that we should celebrate it when it breaks surface. That mood showed that in their overwhelming majority, working people in this country do not want austerity and they do not want war. And it was so, so incredible to see them. I, I think the majority of news reports I saw ran along these lines. The Iraq war was over. Ed Miliband was opponent of the Iraq war, Iraq war uh, so he says. So how could there possibly be a victory for George Galloway in Bradford West? W without acknowledging for a second there is a war taking place in Afghanistan, which was the one that George actually campaigned on, and more wars threatened, which frightened the living daylights out of people in this country to an even greater extent than the Iraq war itself. Now that's what people feel. And that's what we must draw heart from George's victory, uh, from the Occupy movement, from the demonstrations over pensions that the trade unions were involved in. There is a majority in this country that wants to hear these things and wants to see opposition to austerity and war. And I'm speaking today on uh, behalf of the, the Stop the War Coalition, so I want to say a little bit about the importance of that, uh, of that work. You see... I agree with very much of what, uh, of what Sabah said in his introduction and of what Sami has already said, and I'll touch on some of those points uh, my, those, my, myself. But we have in this country one absolutely unique job. It is a job that no Syrian in Damascus or elsewhere can accomplish, just as it was no job that an Iraqi in Iraq could accomplish, no job that an Afghan in Afghanistan could accomplish. It is the job of dealing with the British government and with its ally, the United States government. Nobody in the countries that become victims of imperialism can deal with the governments that send their armed forces there in the way that we can in this country. Our business is about getting our government off their back. Our business is making sure that whatever decisions Iraqis or Afghans or Syrians make about the future of their country, they make it without the interference of the great powers who have ruined these areas of the world for 200 or more years. It is surely time in the 21st century when the colonial mindset and the imperial intervention that goes with it must be ended. It is not the business. not the business of the British government, which has sustained more dictators in its history than practically any other imperial power, including the United States, to dictate who will and who will not rule Syria or Iran or Afghanistan. That is not the government's business in this country. It can barely rule this country, never mind about rule anybody else's reconstruct areas of Bradford, never mind about reconstruct areas of Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq or Iran. So hands off 
That's the message, the overwhelmingly important message that only we can deliver with the force that we can deliver is hands off, no intervention in Syria or Iran or anywhere else in the, in the Middle East. And that means that the intervention which is taking place has to stop because there isn't a hot war in Syria, but there is a war, a covert war in Syria. There is intelligence and logistics being delivered to some of the FSA forces. There is, through the organizing center of counter-revolution in the whole of the Middle East, the Saudi regime, money being pumped into this business. And with every weapon that's delivered, with every piece of intelligence that's delivered, with every sanction that's imposed, with every dollar that's delivered uh, from Saudi, the forces inside Syria that stand for genuine change are diminished and weakened and marginalised, and the forces that stand for cooperation with imperialism, for reaction, are strengthened. And that's what's happening. What is happening is that they are buying a revolution, they are bribing a revolution, they are coercing a revolution into a counter-revolution. And nobody, nobody can be in the slightest doubt that this process is possible. This is not alchemy, we are not transmuting base metal into gold, we are actually transmuting a popular uprising into a tool of imperialism, and we know it can happen because we saw it happen in the Libyan case. So nobody after Libya can say that this is impossible. It is possible. It is possible, and it is happening, and we want it to stop. And one of the things about demanding centrally forcefully, first, second and third, that there should be no imperial intervention in Syria is about buying what limited time may be left to the people that Sami and Sabah described to correct the situation. Now, I don't believe they will, in actual fact. I think the current is running too strongly in the opposite direction. But if there is a chance, it depends on the space and the time that can be bought by the people who can only deal most effectively with the imperial powers, and that is the people who protest and demand that the intervention that's already taking place stop and that there be no further escalation in this process. And I think it's important to understand the context here because I think people sometimes imagine that all the revolutions in the Middle East are going to be like or could be like the Tunisian and the Egyptian revolution at the beginning of this process. But in fact, something fundamental changed in the midpoint of the year which makes it impossible for the later revolutionary processes and those revolutionary processes that have taken longer because the regimes, like the Syrian regime, uh, had a stronger popular base than the Mubarak regime or the Ben Ali regime. There is something which happened which transformed that situation. Egypt and Tunisia were almost uniquely fortunate in moving so fast and with such decisive force against regimes that were so hollowed out that they achieved victories before the imperial powers could reorganize themselves to effectively intervene. But once that had happened, the imperial powers understood what the threat was and reorganized in order to meet it. And the decisive point where that reorganization of the imperial powers uh, bore fruit for them was in the not coincidental experiences in Bahrain and in Libya. The Bahrain ex experience is obvious and easier to describe. Simply through their allies in the area, they crushed the Bahraini revolution, completely crushed it. So completely were they determined to crush it that the Saudi invasion and the domestic forces of reaction in Bahrain even leveled the Pearl Roundabout, the Tahir Square of the Bahrain revolution to remove any physical trace that there had been a revolution in this area, and that was agreed by the Americans when the Defense Secretary of America visited the area two days before that, uh, before that happened. But exactly the same forces, the Americans allied to the Saudis and the Qataris intervened in Libya at almost exactly the same time in order to prevent a popular revolution uh, developing, in order to corrupt it, to buy it, to influence it, and to end in an absolutely standing disaster, denounced by the human rights organisations now, a country which is on the verge of splitting between its east and its west, 
where, as Seamus Minnell uh, revealed in The Guardian, 30,000 people, not, not even the, the death toll in, in Syria now, but 30,000 people lost their lives in that intervention. And that can only happen when an advanced military machine of the type which is uniquely owned by the Western powers is let loose on a, on a country. Even a bloody civil war, a uh, domestic civil war, cannot cause that level of disaster. And if there were no other reason for uh, standing against intervention in Syria or the proposed attack on Iran, it is to understand what a Western military machine does when it is unleashed. We are talking about just the American military having a defence expenditure greater than the 10 biggest defence expenditures after it all added together. That is an overwhelmingly powerful, destructive military machine and when it is unleashed on a country, it does incalculable damage and incalculably greater damage than any domestic struggle for power within that country uh, could possibly do. So even, even if that were the only criteria, we would say that this will do more harm than good. But it will do more harm than good in a much longer time frame as well. It will secure what the Iraq occupation could not secure. It will secure a base for operations for imperialism in the Middle East. It will weaken Iran, which is the real strategic target here, because as William Hague has said, there is a Cold War in the Middle East, um, as a product actually, or partly a product of the failure in, in Iraq. What the failure of US policy in Iraq did was to create Iran as a stronger regional power than it was before. And if you look at Iran, uh, from the position of Langley, Virginia, you don't just see Iran, you see Iran's connection to Syria, you see Iran's connection to Hamas, you see Iran's connection to Hezbollah. And so the process of weakening Syria is a process that's aimed also at Iran and may, and may be a prelude to an attack on Iran, or indeed they may decide simply to attack uh, Iran uh, directly. But in any case, the fates of these countries are bound together in the eyes of uh, American imperialism. So, as Sammy said, we are in a uniquely dangerous era, a era of imperial aggression. It is trying to refurbish itself, trying to refurbish the discredited notion of humanitarian intervention by drawing on our sympathy for the Arab revolutions in order to subvert and destroy and corrupt and invade the Arab states. We cannot allow that to happen. We stand full square for everybody and anybody who is willing to fight for democracy and progress, not only in the Arab world, but globally. But we stand without exception and without qualification against all those who imagine for a moment that the imperial powers could possibly be an agent for that kind of change. It is in the DNA of the imperial powers that they must rule against the will of the people whose resources they want, whose protests they want to crush, whose aspirations they cannot meet. It is in the character of the beast that it will not deliver these things. And so our first, our main duty, if we live here, if we are in the centre of an imperial power, is to get them off the back of the Arab revolutions. Right. the point about the Muslim Brotherhood because, I, because it's, it's very, very important that it is not said that the Muslim Brotherhood and the imperialists are the same thing. This is simply, this is simply rubbish. Um, it, one is a major, it is the major imperial power in the world, the biggest economy in the world, the mi biggest military in, in the world, which is actually organising the exploitation and the oppression of the countries where by and large the Muslim Brotherhood operate. The Muslim Brotherhood, as uh, Sami's put it very, very well, have a dual character. Many, many times, as he's elaborated in the past, they have cooperated both with the domestic ruling class and with the imperialists. But there are other occasions, 10 years of opposition and more under Mubarak, where they were in opposition uh, to the, uh, to the uh, regime. They weren't the first into Tahir Square, but they did come to Tahir Square. 
And even though they are now currently, because actually, at, partly as a result of the opposition to Mubarak, one of the strongest elements in Egyptian society, they still are playing a dual role. For the most part, they are cooperating with the uh, military regime, but on certain, uh, at certain important points, for instance, in the launching of the second revolution in November, they returned to Tier Square because the deal with the military regime was breaking down from their point of view. So if we want to understand that they are sometimes, and on some conditions, willing to join progressive forces, even if their ideology brings them into alignment with the domestic ruling class and the imperialism on other occasions, then we have to grasp this dual, this dual, uh, this dual character. I mean, Al-Qaeda, again, is a completely different thing, and arguing Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood are the same thing is simply political ignorance. But even with Al-Qaeda, let's face it, Al-Qaeda fought with the Americans against the Russians in Afghanistan, uh, against the, the uh, Americans in Afghanistan, sided with the Americans, and then against the Americans being in Saudi. Actually, you just need to be a little bit more attentive to the history and analyse it a little bit more closely than to simply say they're the same as imperialism. This will not help you understand the way in which the, the world works. And it will not, crucially, if the Egyptian revolutionaries had taken this view, they wouldn't have been in a situation where the entire youth wing of the Muslim Brotherhood came away from the Muslim Brotherhood, joined uh, the forces in Tahir Square, and are now part of the Socialist Popular Alliance Party, which elected seven revolutionary MPs to the Egyptian parliament. So you, you will disable progressive forces if you have a simplistic view that they're one reactionary, one reactionary mass. That's one point. On the Syrian revolution, um, I, I agree actually absolutely with the formulation that, uh, that, that, Sami, that Sami has had. This started as a, popular, uh, as a popular uprising. It still has elements, especially in the local coordinating committees, who do not want to see imperialism, who are against imperialist intervention, who stand for democracy, who stand for socialism, uh, many of them. But the, and it may even be true, as, as you suggested, and I don't, I don't for a moment discount, discount the truthfulness of what you're saying about the experience on the ground, but the difficulty is this. There's a rupture between what may well be happening locally and what many local activists happen, uh, want to happen, what many of the local coordinating committees represent, and what the dominant political representation is coming to be. And the dominant political representation is the Syrian National Council, is dominated actually by mostly by people who are outside the country, mm -hmm. um, is dominated because the militarization, Sam is absolutely right about this, militarization helps reaction. Why? What does militarization mean? Militarization means that you've got a force on the side of the revolution which doesn't have weapons, and a state which does have weapons. So what do the people on the side of the revolution say? Where the hell do we get weapons? Now, where's the big way you get weapons in the world? You go to the imperialist powers because they're the people who've got more weapons and more money to supply you than anywhere else. But the weapons never come free. The weapons always come with political influence. They always come, they always come with them selecting. We will negotiate with you for the weapons and we will choose you for the minister and we will choose you to lead the, the movement. And what is happening now is that the centre of gravity is ever more quickly running away from the local committees and the people on the ground who want to fight and running towards the elements within the opposition, especially the emigre elements and especially the armed elements who are most susceptible to being bought and bribed by the imperialists. Now that's what's happening. I don't like it. I really don't like it. But that's what's happening. And the best possible assistance that we can give to people is to argue as forcefully as we can, both here and with anybody amongst the Syrian opposition who thinks that this is a good idea, that this is the road to disaster. It's the road to disaster for us, for everybody in the region, and for the Syrian revolution. That's the argument that we should put. A couple of announcements, actually. There is a sheet of the problems thrown up by the revolution end up in a different place. It happens in every single revolution that you care, that you care to mention. Oliver Cromwell in the 17th century yeah. English Revolution starts off as a revolutionary and ends up shooting revolutionaries. The Danton starts off as a revolutionary in the French Revolution, ends up on yeah, the other yeah. side. John, now, if you want us to go back to our houses in Syria and stop this revolution and say, do you know what, Assad is better no, than no, 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 no,
no imperialist intervention. Yes. The people who are I leading this that. in this we direction are, are scum who are going to sell us to the imperialists. We don't, we don't, we want to keep fighting Assad, and we don't want the imperialists. Yeah. That's the position. <laughs> that is the position. That. But, the, but uh, uh, yeah, there are people saying that. But you have to take on board the fact that what happens when the imperial powers intervene is they magnify massively yeah. politically magnify the forces that are sympathetic to them and minimize and suppress the forces that are hostile to them. So they are, what do you think happens when the, when the Saudi state today decides it's going, to, it's going to funnel money to the FSA? Do you think they're doing that because they think that's an absolutely brilliant thing? They want influence, they're buying influence, it's what the Saudis do. So they are buying a chunk of the revolution. That's what happens. And, you, and, and this is why you cannot have an analysis of the revolutions now without calculating the massive effect that imperial intervention, both directly from the imperial part and through their local surrogates in the area, is happening, happening, having on this process. It's, it's just a question of looking, the, uh, of looking the reality in the face. Now, now I, <coughs> Sammy and I are, and, and George are describing a process as it's developed up to this point. It's not absolutely written in stone that it will continue in this in this direction. I think, you see, if you look at the way they dealt with the Arab revolutions, they dealt with them by crushing them, as in the Bahrain case, buying them and subverting them as they did in the Libyan case, as they're trying to do in the Syrian case. There is one other variant, and that's the Yemeni case. And what they've done in the Yemeni case is to try and organize a transition so that you get the Salah regime without Salah. That's what they tried to do. Now they can do. I love this debate yeah, because you, you, you will have to let me actually articulate the point before you interrupt me. Um, and the point, and the point is here. They could do that in Yemen because the Yemeni ruling class is a wholly owned subsidiary of the uh, of the Saudis and the Americans, and they could the Salah. You know, he gets as soon as he's ill, he gets transported to the Saudi, then he gets transported to America. That tells you what you need to know. In a particular, in a peculiar way, the fact that the imperialists haven't yet actually managed to intervene in a hot war, and the fact that they can't also crush the revolution completely has produced a kind of stalemate in the situation in, in Syria. Now, they're gaining ground, but they may go for a Yemeni solution where they try and have the Assad regime without Assad, or incorporate elements of the opposition into a, into a post-Assad Assad regime. That's, that's, that's a possible variant of what could happen. Now, in a way, in some ways, I think that's, that would be a credit to us because we fought the imperialists to a standstill so that they can't directly intervene in a hot war, even though they've managed to intervene covertly and organised it. If that happens, to be honest, there may be a long, long period after this where the revolution continues as a civil me me method of protest against a successor government. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. All I'm saying is that any of these variants depend on us minimising the imperialist intervention in this and criticising those people who are arguing that they should be allowed to intervene. Any possible life for the revolution after this, any possible post-Assad um, regime and a, a, an organisation on, on a basis of democracy and peace and socialism or trade unionism or any of these things after this depends on keeping the imperialists out. So the absolutely fundamental issue, especially if we're here in an imperialist country, is the argument with our own government, and insofar as there are elements inside Syria who are arguing in favour of our government, then we have to say you are wrong. And that's really, it's not much more complex than that. Thank you.